Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast. It's me, Rob, from the YouTube channel Motobob, and I'm joined by Tim. How's it going? It's good. It is going well. You sound very gleeful today, which is good. I just feel in a good mood because we're doing the podcast. I've been really enjoying it recently, so... That's nice. Yeah, it's all good. I thought we'd jump back in today with some new stories. We did the same last week. Just some of the stuff that I haven't covered on the main channel, but the ones that caught our eye. And the first one is the fact that the MV Augusta Super Veloce 1000 is now production ready. Uh, Cycle World reported on this one saying that it will be rolling through the factory soon and they are going to release them in Q3. This is the Seri Oro limited edition version, which is their highest end, like super premium sub-brand. Q3 of 2024, they'll be in dealers and it's basically this bike, a uh, love child of mm -hmm. the fantastic Brutale 1000RR inline four that makes over 200 horsepower that both myself and Tim rode out in Italy from their factory last year or uh, the year before? The year before, actually, yeah. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> The love child of, wait, not that experience, not the love child of me and Tim. It was the love <laughs> child of the Brutale 1000 RR and uh, the Super Veloce 800. But this combination, mate, is very special. And I would probably go so far as to say that I think it is one of the most beautiful motorcycles ever made, in my opinion. Mm. And I was wondering, if not the, it's really up there for me. I was wondering if you shared the same opinion. Yeah, it's it's as with anything where you're like, oh, give me the best of all time. It's really, really hard, and you'd want to limit it to like five or ten even. But it's it's absolutely in the uh, top ten for me. Yeah, it's stunning. I don't know what to, to sort of describe it in comparison to the old Super Veloce, the 800, but um, a bit beefier maybe, just a little bit sort of chonkier. Yeah, I mean, there's the fact that you've got more cylinders, so naturally it's going to sit a little bit wider, yeah, I suppose, a, tri a four versus a triple. I'd agree it definitely looks a bit more girthy. I think it's also the fact that it's the Super Veloce, but yeah. on steroids, if you will, or mm. more inspired by the Brutale 1000RR, which is more swooping lines and yes. curves, and, and it just looks like it's on a race program. It's got winglets, which are a bit yeah, MotoGP yeah, yeah. inspired. It's got the carbon disc covers down the bottom, again, race inspired. Yeah. But it's just got details everywhere you look. Yeah. The little quadruple exhaust poking out under the saddle and it's quite the impressive. wheels mate have you had a look at the wheels uh, yeah have a look <laughs> i mean what yeah. you, you look at the bike and then you sort of look a little bit further and you notice more details you get this sort of there's the initial impact that you get with it and then you study it a little bit further and it's a really really fine balance between putting more details on without mm. making it look busy or cluttered which i think is just brilliant design when it comes down to it that's the definition of brilliant design is if you can put all these extra details on and it not detract from the sort of overall silhouette. Yeah, then you've you've nailed it. Basically. What about that single sided rear wheel though? Is it, it I mean it must be cast aluminium, but are they little spokes in it, wedged in there as well? Yeah, it looks like it. Little red spokes in between the actual cast wheels as a little flourish. Just the details, it's, mate. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. If you look at the tail section, you've got the extra, you've got that hump on it, obviously, which and that stop, which obviously stops you sliding off the seat, which on a bike like this probably is a prudent decision. But you've also got that extra little trim. It's almost like a spoiler on the tail section, but it looks so good. The overall silhouette of it, for me, you know that definition when someone says that something looks like it's doing 200 mile an hour standing still? This is this really does look like it is doing some silly That is a fair comment. Just standing still. Yeah. Yes. It's funny with the winglets. I thought they looked gross when they first came out on some of the bikes, like the Fireblade. Mm, not the Fireblade. It was more the Ducatis that had them first, I think. Mm. I was just like, what are those? They look terrible. But now they've become a bit normalized. Mm. And you were just mentioning what looks like i mean it's not really like error it's more a piece of design yeah. but i was thinking have you seen the ktm bikes the moto gp bikes where they're testing a rear spoiler and then also there's one where they're testing a tiny winglet spoiler thing right on the leading edge of the front mud guard which is the most marginal of marginal gains right but i'm concerned basically because i feel like the side winglets have become normal to my eyes and i don't want i don't ever want a tiny winglet on the front of the mudguard or one on the back of the seat. 
I mean, yeah, I've just to seen the normal. one on the rear seat, yeah, or on these where the it's massive, isn't it? It's yeah, it's bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, not good. Nah, I hope not. Anyway, uh, this bike, you know, as I said, could be right up there for me in terms of the best of the best. But are there any other candidates that you would say make for the best designed or most beautiful motorcycles in history? In history, in recent memory, I think Ducati gets a real big mention for yes. um, things like the Devil and things like the Panigale V4 for me actually is really nice for silhouettes. Very nice indeed. I've seen what your kind of what your suggestions are, and I do definitely agree with at least two of them. I'm not sure about the other one actually. Well, I was thinking back to you know in history, what are some of the best looking bikes? The 916 is like the benchmark. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to compare these two side by side. The MV is a lot more modern. The 916 is like classic timeless lines. But probably most people, I'm going to say, are going to say that the 916 is a better design than this. I think this might be too busy for mm-hmm. some people. What's your take? Yeah, I, the 916, yeah, there's something really nice about simple, clean designs. There is a balance to how much stuff you can put on it before it's playing buckaroo and you just kind of, you, you've thrown too much stuff at it. But yeah, I can see the argument for the simpler, cleaner lines of the 916 being better, yeah. I also think there's some of those classic bikes, Ducatis, and uh, I noted down the Kawasaki Z1 as being a real iconic looking bike. Mm. We made some show notes before. <laughs> And one that I put on there was the Honda NC30. Yeah. And that's the one you're not agreeing with. No, that's the one I agree with. I love that. Oh, which one was it then that you didn't agree with? It was the Kawasaki Z1 where I was like, I looked at it, I was like, I I think I could find nicer of that era. I don't think it's one of the ones that sort of stands out to me. What, like a Bonneville type thing is more pleasing to your eye? Yeah, to me. Some of the, you know, Nortons and the Bonnevilles and stuff like that, for me, look a little bit nicer. But Mm. yeah, the NC30 is definitely in my list. Yeah, something like that. Those sort of... 80s 90s sports bikes i mean that's pretty much like a peak example of getting that right Mm -hmm. but i actually think the mv might beat that i think it's only the 916 i could think of i was also thinking as well just around like naked bikes what's the best looking naked bike ever made i'm not just saying this because you just bought one but i was thinking (laughs) about the gk monster honestly for real nice yeah no and that is that's justified yep I think maybe even the S2R that you bought is like the best version of it as well. (laughs) Yeah. I was really thinking about it. I was like, it's not like me maybe to be so positive about your Italian motorcycle choices. No, this is refreshing. I think you might have nailed it. (laughs) Thank you. Definitely there is a vote in there for it being one of the prettier looking monsters in my eyes, yes. There is one thing which is the catalytic converter I think is a massive down point, but it's very easily remedied. So once you fix that, actually it's really nice. Is it under the back sort of down? under the swing yeah, arm. Yeah, near the it. swing arm. Yeah, exactly. It basically looks like a cow's udder and that is an accurate description <laughs> of it and it needs to come off immediately <laughs> and has on mine, luckily. So uh, we're all good. But yeah, I think the proportions of it and it's such a delicate balance just make it look beautiful to me. Yeah. What's the best looking bike you've ever owned? Owned? Oh, I don't know, man. It's like choosing your favourite child. For me, one of my motorgazes probably would be one of the one of my prettiest bikes. I would argue, but I can see V seven. Yeah, the white yeah. one. There's something about the V seven, and I I tweaked a little bit of it, so it was a little bit cleaner than stock. I personally really like that, but it's down to your taste, isn't it? It's such a subjective thing. What's your prettiest bike? What's the one you've owned? that you like most well i'm not saying prettiest but like the coolest looking one was definitely when i had the street twin with the stupid big blocky tires on it it just looked completely badass handled like a dog (laughs) i'm pretty sure as well the bumpiness of the knobbly tires they were the continental tkc 80s so quite off-road focused the knobbliness on the front i'm sure like messed up the bearings as well in the steerer Uh, headset bearings but still it did look great later on i sort of fitted different parts and made it a bit more street biased again but for just like tearing around london on for something that looked a bit mad max-esque with those tires on yeah i really like that although i did tell you actually recently i'm in the throes of customizing my sv650 and my goal is to make that look better than the street twin and then i can finally rest and be at peace with myself I'm making good progress as well. Like I say, I've um, got a headlight housing on, headlight brackets, little fly screen. So it's an SV650S. I've completely removed the little half fairing that was on it. Yeah, I'll have to post up some pics or something at some point. But it's almost like when you're doing something like this, you don't want to 
show too much of it because I'm not like a build channel world show progress. Mm. So I'd rather just keep it to myself until it's done. So I don't want anyone judging it in its <laughs> half cooked form. Uh, no, there's no judgment <laughs> online. The internet is not a place for judgment. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> anyway, well, that does it, mate. I think it's right up there, but perhaps the 916 is the pinnacle. Let us know in the comments, everybody, which one you would go for, or if there's something we miss. I'm sure there's loads of bikes we missed that are definite candidates. Sure. But moving swiftly on, one of the stories that caught my eye earlier this week was the fact that Cake electric motorcycles... Super modern and unusual looking. I think they filed for bankruptcy. I think they were looking for more funding, basically, because they're in startup mode where they need these rounds of funding to keep going. And they didn't find it, so they filed for bankruptcy. And it's a kind of interesting one, mate, because it, it's got me questioning, are electric bikes even viable for companies to produce at the moment? It seems like they were operating at a loss. I think Zero operate at a loss as well. Mm. And also, if you look at things like Livewire, when Harley launched that, it didn't really go that well, and they spun it out into a separate brand and kind of put it to the side. I mean, what is it? Why is it just people aren't buying them or Has to be. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, I'm going to go into this as a completely ignorant audience member to business. I don't know the finer workings of business, but it must just be that they're not getting the same sort of demand at the moment, which is why I think with cars or just electric companies in general i think they're at their strongest position when they are partnered with an already established brand and then mm. it's you know you can take a risk on an offshoot rather than just a complete startup which yeah. is obviously quite hard to build something up from from zero i think it must just be that there's just not the demand for bikes as there is for cars because you do see loads of electric cars on the on the road but just uh, i very wild, rarely see you know it's quite a novelty when you're riding past you go oh, oh electric bike and you actually see one in the wild. Finally somebody. Yeah, you don't see them very often at all. Yeah, it's a fair point. And also, they've got to be super R&D intensive at the moment. Even though they're kind of simple, aren't they? Electric bikes. Just a battery and a, <laughs> and a motor yeah. slapped into a <laughs> motorcycle chassis. It's not rocket science. No. So when's yours coming out? Uh, no, it is difficult. I'm sure it... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I'm doing with the SV. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It, no, it must be fairly expensive to get started, and then it just doesn't seem like the sales yeah. volumes are there at the moment. But I think yeah. it's a real shame for Cake, because um, I walked past their stand at Eichmann this year, and it looked really impressive. Mm. They've just got all manner of weird and wonderful-looking bikes. True. The more utilitarian, urban-type things. Yeah, yeah. But recently, they came out with the Buck, I think it's called, which is more like a dirt bike, enduro bike-type bike thing mm -hmm. but in their typical silver and yeah. minimal scandy styling and i was yeah. like wow that looks pretty smart they're very Bit unique looking for me it really comes down it just does not make any logical sense to go for the electric bike at the moment i think a lot of people who are riding bikes unless you live in one of these high rises where you've got somewhere to plug it in overnight you can't really leave it outside yeah. your house it's not like you can street park it and still charge it so where are you going to charge the thing and they cost more if you look at cake as great as they are and i did do a bit of research because i was like maybe that would work for my commuting into london they're like twice the price of an equivalent sort of speed power capacity oh. kind of motorcycle when i look at i could get a husqvarna mm. 401 or i can get a cake for twice the price it just doesn't make any sense for me so maybe there's that do you know what i feel a bit sad about as well yeah naturally the price is going to be a big factor we were saying this last week with the honda announcement they're going to build more and more electric bikes by was it 2035 they had loads of goals for how many they're mm. going to produce and how profitable they'll be how many they'll sell uh, we saw with kawasaki when we went to motorcycle live they had two electrics two hybrids is it now yeah yeah and it feels like the as you say the big guns can come in now and possibly afford to develop them and yet sell them at a more reasonable price point mm -hmm. and so all these companies mm -hmm. like cake and zero who have to get rounds of funding and they can't afford to sell the bikes at a comparable cost to a normal petrol bike mm. are kind of falling by the wayside as these big companies just sweep in and do it their way mm. and maybe that's a bit of a shame because we had some cool and interesting stuff from the likes of cake and zero to some extent i wouldn't say they were you know quite as stylistically impressive or interesting as the cakes but yeah maybe maybe it's going to go more mainstream and we'll just get electric versions of a uh, cb125 now for eight grand yeah. or something like that <laughs> Probably, but that's yeah. effectively what Kawasaki have announced, isn't it? A yeah. Z E1 and yeah. the Ninja E1 or whatever it's called. So it's a bit of a shame. But anyway, 
speaking of Honda and their new motorcycle developments, I just had to include this story. I mean, I saw the headline which said on Cycle World, we're getting a lot of stories from them the last couple of weeks, but it is an excellent website. Honda developing GB350 based Himalayan rival. And the GB350 is a really cool looking little single cylinder retro type bike that they sell in Asian markets, but they don't sell here. And so I was like, oh, it's such a shame we don't get that bike. Saw that headline and thought, wow, they're going to make a single cylinder little adventure bike that does a similar job to the Himalayan. That makes a lot of sense for their hmm. Asian market aspirations. But maybe we'll get it and we'll get a nice little mini Honda adventure bike. Clicked on the story. I mean, have you looked at it, mate? Yeah, I for, genuinely, I thought that was the Himalayan. <laughs> I did the same thing. I thought that that was the Himalayan and they were going to show that design and then down below was where Honda's was going to be. And then I sort of read a little bit further and went... Oh my good God, that is exactly the same looking. It's absolutely wild, isn't yeah. it? How similar it is. Yeah. I did the exact same thing. I was like, why are they showing me a picture of a Himalayan at the top of the article? Yeah. Scrolling down, looking for something else specific to the <laughs> Honda. But OMG, I, I mean, there's so many points at which you could pull out similarities to the Himalayan. Obviously, with a single-cylinder semi-retro-styled adventure bike, there's going to be some proportional similarities anyway. But I'm looking at the little metal frame around the headlight and down the front of the side panels. Yeah. The side panels themselves. Yeah. The shape of the tank. Yeah. The shape of the seat. Yeah. The split seat design. The yeah. shape of the side panels. Even, like, the windscreen area looks kind of similar. It's got me thinking, our oh, Honda... I mean, is that not embarrassing for them? Well, it depends that f where they're going to launch it, right? Because if, if the GB is something that they only really sell in the Indian market, then maybe they're all too sort of familiar with it and it's, and it's less of a kind of taboo. But yeah, possibly, I don't know. Depends. If they're going to do this in sort of mass market and sell it worldwide, then yeah, maybe a little bit. And Honda like, like to just copy someone's design. Yeah, I don't, don't think I've ever seen that before from Honda. It's not like their MO to just go and copy bikes. No. But I mean, the thing that's even more, well, that rams it home a bit is if you scroll down and they've got a Scrambler version of it. Yeah, yeah, Scram 4 And it looks like the Scram 4 yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. yeah. There's only so far you can kind of go with a certain genre or bike. It just looks too familiar yeah. and too similar yeah. that it seems like a blatant copy. And that's what, what it's got me kind of like wondering about is, well, where is your design style and your core offering? You know, what's your Honda-ness? In the same way that there are sort of styling similarities in lines of cars like BMWs over the years with the kidney grills and they mm. just evolve it into different shapes or whatever. It's like abandoning what makes a Honda a Honda yeah. and just doing what Royal Enfield do, which is that classic retro style that pretty much is part of most of the bikes that they build maybe not the new himalayan it looks a bit less like that mm. uh, and just being like yeah okay this is our version of it i don't know mate i thought honda was about getting like something that's a really quality build that has a great finish yeah slightly modern styling sometimes although for the gb i suppose that's less so the case but it still looks like its own thing. Even the GB350 doesn't look like a Enfield Classic 350 or Meteor 350 ripoff. It's really obviously a Honda. No, it, it looks like, yeah, it looks like a classic Honda. They've got loads in their kind of um, back catalogue that it, it replicates. And it's really pretty, actually. It's a cute looking bike. Isn't it just? Yeah. So, yeah, really odd. It could be a masterstroke, mate. It could be. Mate, I feel like someone's just, they've been asked to submit a design and it's gotten <laughs> down to the wire. <laughs> and they've kind of gone. Oh, God, what am I going to do? And they've just gotten some tracing paper and, and uh, gone over it. Oh, jeez. Do you know what that gave me an immediate flashback of? <laughs> what, being in school? Yeah, my homework strategies <laughs> at school. Yeah. <laughs> How's that uh, motorcycle design coming? <laughs> oh, nearly done. It is yeah. nearly done. I, oh, I'll bring it in tomorrow. <laughs> and then, like you say, trace it. Yeah. And then get it back on the normal paper. Yeah, yeah. No one will know the difference. I love the way that they've labelled it as well. That's like with all the numbers, 19, 18, 24. I imagine the yeah. key for all these numbers just says <laughs> Himalayan wheels, yeah. Himalayan headlight, yeah. Himalayan mirrors. Yeah. 
I don't know. Yeah, it could be a master stroke, like I say, because if it's a, such a popular bike in India and they sell in huge volumes, for example, then just make something similar. And you'll also sell in huge volumes, especially if you can undercut them or yes. make it slightly more powerful yeah. or something like that. But I just feel like I never look at Honda like that. If it was like, a, I don't know, like a Chinese copy of a bike or something, like we see that occasionally, it wouldn't surprise me so much. But man... Let us know what you think in the comments, people who are watching on the full episode YouTube version. Is it embarrassing? Does it look similar? Which would sell better as well? Do you think if they copy it, people are just going to be like, Ugh, why have you just copied the Himalayan? I'm just going to buy a Himalayan instead. Anyway, my friend, moving swiftly on, we're on to comments of the week, a new regular segment because it's the <laughs> second time I've done it. So that makes it regular, yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, yeah, very regular. And this week I've pulled out, we had a section in a recent podcast where we were talking about loud exhausts and whether they are appropriate anymore, whether people have moved on or not. And there were so many comments back about that, that I thought we'd do a little temperature check by featuring some of the common themes. And so we'll start with Rage Rider, who said, typically, when I was a lot younger, I wanted the loudest can possible, but not for a long time now. And then, oh, for shrage. <laughs> said, I am old. The stock CB650R exhaust is loud for me. So I think that's a reflection of what you were saying mm. last time round, mate. Mm -hmm. the people are just getting more sensible yeah. as they age. Yeah. And probably the general biking audience is aging. Let's face it. <laughs> but yeah, our audience probably, yes, exactly that. <laughs> I said the general biking audience, mate. Don't go after our audience. No, no, we're getting older and we're, we're getting, you know, a little bit uh, more mature. So we're, yeah, our audience is growing up with us. I agree. I still stand by that completely. I will die on that sword. Yeah, when, when you first get it, definitely for the first few, you're like, oh, yeah, as loud as I possibly can. And then at a certain point you go, I'm going deaf. So I need to change it. Indeed. You've got to save those money makers mate when you're editing videos you can't do it without exceptional hearing you need dog levels of hearing to get all the cuts right and so that's part of it as well probably ass wet man says i got cut up in boston and the driver said they didn't see or hear me i've retrofitted some louder slip-ons to my harley st i don't even know what a harley st is harley st low rider st maybe anyway not obnoxious but louder with all the distractions for drivers, we need all the help we can get. Tim. Yes. We both used to commute through London. Yeah, still do. But I'm a bit out of the loop now. Mm. But would you still say that's a factor in those moments when people kind of move over and nearly knock you off? Yeah, some, well, sometimes. What you can't do is slap a loud exhaust on your bike and just go, everyone's going to hear me, problem solved, and get mad yeah. at people when they don't. Because someone might be blasting Taylor Swift, for all you know, and they can't hear your exhaust <laughs> until, obviously, you're a lot closer to them. So it's not a hard and fast rule, and you can't start riding like everyone's going to hear or see you. Um, you still need yeah. to ride defensively, would be my tip, regardless. But... I've definitely had the experience. I had a um, Yamaha Virago with a very loud, that was obnoxiously loud, and I didn't fit it, obviously. But driving through traffic with that, I could see people like four cars down start to move over. I was like, oh, this does work to a certain degree because that was quite loud. And because it was a twin, it's a lower kind of decibel. I think it's a little bit worse when it's like four cylinder, three cylinder. That really does get into your ears a bit. But with a two cylinder, it doesn't quite hit your ears quite, you know, as badly as, um, mm. as it can with others. So you can get away with a slightly louder sound and it still sounds somewhat sweet. But yeah, I could see cars way off in the distance parting like the Red Sea. So it does work. Yeah. But um, like I say, go with caution. It's got to be one factor mm. amongst many. And the main one is riding like people haven't seen you, I suppose. Yes. But yeah, yeah. It, it still maybe can help in certain scenarios. We always say as well, it's projecting out the back. And so there is True. perhaps room for an urban exhaust design, which maybe points out the back and points out the front. <laughs> so that when you give it a blip. Yeah, trumpets it to the people at the front. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Also, we've got 1148 with the worst noise offenders, a 125 riders that try to make their bikes sound more powerful. Sounds effing horrible. And you were just saying a twin sounds all right. Yes. A four, a bit more irritating. A little bit screamy sometimes, yeah. A triple? Mm, yeah. Similar to a yeah, four, maybe. Four. But I think a single has to be probably, I agree, the most irritating sound. 
of a loud exhaust. I mean, as a, as a biker, yeah, if you're in the high street and you hear that one two five with the L plates and delivery stickers all over it come sailing past you and you can hear it from miles away, you do tend to be like, oh, mate, give it a rest. <laughs> it does, it, yeah, it is a little bit annoying. And also, you know that they're sort of colouring somebody's opinion of bikers and you're like, but I'm a biker as well and I don't do that. Please don't judge mate, me the same. Mate, non-bikers don't care if you've got a an authentic V twin or... <laughs> They don't care. No, I know. Like, but what oh, I'm saying is like... Not all bikers are bad because we're not all riding singles. Well, exactly. No, no, but one, like two, they tar us all with the same brush. So you get like a little one, two, five who's starting <laughs> and out of traffic, riding obnoxiously <laughs> with an exhaust which annoys even other bikers. And you're there going, please don't think all bikers are like that because I don't ride like that and I don't sound like that when I'm out. And yeah, mine sounds a lot nicer. Mine's got a much nicer... <laughs> the nuances of an Italian V-twin... <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i think this is maybe not judgmental what i'm going to say i'm sort of making prejudices around this sort of rider or maybe the brand and i don't have any hard statistical evidence to support it with a large sample size so this is a big caveat <laughs> okay but when i picture in my head small bike mm. with like a straight through and it'll be the cheapest ebay straight through system they could get yeah. i'm thinking straight away Wait, on three, say which bike you're thinking of. Oh, okay. One, two, three. Yamaha R125. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. R125 or MT... Is it MT125? Uh, Something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. That was excellent. Yeah. It's always that. Wow, then that's enough. <laughs> I don't need to go and do a large-scale study of no, this because 100%. we just... Yeah, you were two for two. And that wasn't in the show notes. Exactly. Yeah, anyway, it really does remind me of a small dog that's barking away <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. yes just like chill out mate you're a little dog yeah don't worry about it no one's got a problem with that <laughs> you're just protesting too much drawing more attention to yourself yeah. and then a bit you know big dog's gonna come and oh are you the big dog you're gonna gobble Wait, out hang on. i'm lost <laughs> in my analogy <laughs> But do you know what I mean? You're riding around yeah, on an yeah, yeah. R125, like, oh, look at me with yes. my big bad bike. Yeah. An R1 with a stock exhaust is always going to roll up and just smoke you. Yeah. So don't draw attention to yourself. I'd go stealth if I was on one of those little bikes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, not at all stealth. Moving on to our second <laughs> regular segment would be Bike of the Week. And if people have got submissions for Bike of the Week, leave them in the comments below. It's got to be something weird and wonderful. Last week we had the Pan America that somebody turned into a an enduro style build which was one of the most nonsensical things i've ever seen in terms of motorcycle builds but it kind of worked mm. and that, that's what made it impressive mm. but this week we've got up for sale mm. at bonhams i think for about fifty one thousand dollars starting price a bike called the white lock tinker toy which is a 48 cylinder 4.2 liter kawasaki yes it's a slab of a thing, isn't it, mate? Sir, you have uh, outdone yourself finding this one. <laughs> it is... I wish I... It, this was my first reaction because it was... It probably would have blown the microphone out. I love this. Do I you? love everything about this bike. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just the fact that it was a 48-cylinder, right? Just that description. Now your brain, if you're not looking at this image at the same time as us, it's trying to work out where are these cylinders located? How would you fit 48 cylinders in there? How big are these cylinders going to be? Okay. I mean, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Eight banks. <laughs> and there's two rows there. That would be 16. Mm. Three rows would make 24. Oh, so it's three rows of eight, basically. Mm. It's a combination of 16 Kawasaki KH250 three-cylinder two-stroke engines. Oh, no, it arranged into six banks. Yeah, six banks of eight. And that's how they've achieved it. Just human centipeding them together, <laughs> unfortunately. Sorry. Sorry I had to say that. It's accurate. And that makes 4.2 litres in total, yeah. uh, which is quite something. And when I was watching the startup videos of this that I found on YouTube, mm. he's got his own YouTube channel where the builder posts them. I think he's called Simon Whitelock. That's it. He posts the startups and stuff. I mean, the thing that blew my mind, blew my mind mate, sorry, watching it, is one of the videos where, <laughs> firstly, they have a 50cc two-stroke single-cylinder engine out of a bike that is used as the starter motor for this 48-cylinder bike, which in itself is crazy super practical 
<laughs> yeah, so start that one. Bring ding, 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 ding. Probably kickstart that one. Yeah. And then try and get it to turn this engine over. And the 50cc two-stroke wasn't strong enough to turn the engine over and start pulling the air in and stuff. And so they were just like, oh, back to the drawing board and got a 125 single cylinder engine. <laughs> and that was just about good enough to get it ticking over. Now, have you watched the startup video I, or not? Well, I listened to it, yeah. You're going to say that it sort of blows the microphone out. There's just nothing can contain that yeah. level of noise. Yeah, it just, it's, I hope it sounds better in real life. I want to know what 48 cylinders sounds so like. So do I. And, you'll- and I've watched maybe... <laughs> 10 videos of it and you can hear the 125 single starter motor going you know pop 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 and then as soon as as they start up the 48 cylinder engine every device that that bike has ever been recorded on seems incapable of white noise just yeah just processing that The only, mate, the, literally the only way to see that is in, in real life. You're going to have to go and find this thing. Maybe put a bid in. Put a bid in. Park oh, that up. Yeah, you just, know, scrap the SV. This is what you want to be customised. Actually, you don't even need to customise it. It's done for you. It's all done for you. It's an absolute goer. I'm just going to email Bonhams and say, I'm <laughs> interested in making a bid. I just need to come and see it first. Yeah. I can explain, though, in very simple logic, why no camera on this planet can deal with the the output in terms of volume and you just need to look at that side on picture of it and you can see the size of the engine yes. and all the cylinders in all their banks and then look at the exhaust it's just like a delcovic 200 quid <laughs> do you know what i mean like there's no the ratios are off there oh yeah yeah it's also i mean what's the it's got like a two-stroke thing coming out the back as well what is that coming out the back of where uh, in between the exhausts there's like a third exhaust third leg thing is that for the starter oh yeah that makes sense is it a teeny that one makes sense you're right so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, dear. They say that each of those engines could make 32 horsepower. This is on Silodrome. Uh, We found this story. Another excellent website. Thoroughly recommend. Theoretically, that means that if you stick 16 32 horsepower engines together, theoretically, it could make 512. Although, logically, it probably... That's like very basic maths that probably doesn't play out in reality. (laughs) No, that sounds right to me. I I, I can see no problem with that logic at all. (laughs) It looks absolutely fantastic. The other thing that blew my mind about it. not blew my mind but interesting detail let's say is that they used a gold wing front end yeah and then custom made that big section of frame yeah i think at the back end is custom as well actually why did i have that in the notes custom frame but with the gold wing front end which a gold wing if you're looking for a beefy front end it's an older one you know classic gold wing but if you're looking for a beefy front end that can deal with that sort of 500 horsepower mass. yeah 500 ponies i mean you're gonna need a pretty beefy front end on that i mean look at the stoppers on it as well so if it, god forbid it actually does have 500 horsepower which it definitely doesn't you get that thing in a straight line you need some brakes. yeah trying to stop that thing on them is <laughs> it's gonna be exciting looking at it now again this side on picture which i'm obsessed with do you know what it looks like actually it looks like a pair of novelty <laughs> motorcycle bookends <laughs> and you put the books in the middle <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. or the other thing it looks a little bit like is if you ever try um ai image generation <laughs> <laughs> and just just type in bike just motorcycle and it will do Most, something yeah, like classic this. motorcycle with a big yeah, engine it can't handle it at all it's still not quite at that level yet so yeah you still end up getting something as janky as this the thing that immediately struck me is how long do your arms need to be to <laughs> To Wait, the- come on. They fitted bars nearer the rider, surely, have they? Oh, no, they haven't. No. What? <laughs> How long would your arms need to be? Stretch Armstrong's holding on to this thing. Either that, or you're fully laying prone on that tank and just having a little sleep there. I wonder if it's built to be ridden or not. Oh, this is built to be ridden. Maybe it isn't. Clearly, clearly this is a performance machine. This <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Anyway, you know, anyone who's listening on audio, definitely go and have a look at that. The White Lock Tinker Toy. Uh, Maybe that's actually a clue in the name. Is it just for tinkering? I think so. Yeah. And not for riding. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But yeah, fantastic looking thing. And hats off to anyone who does anything that is obviously so time intensive, expensive, probably immensely frustrating. um, But you get something 
quite fantastic out the other end of all those years probably of, of building that i think that's it for today tim lovely to speak to you as always as always same yeah and we'll be back next week bye